Because there's a mistake. The issue is, oh, <laughs> what do I do now? The issue is, what do I do now? Click it. Right. Um, the issue is I really don't like prime numbers. I thought since it was a mathematical conference, I'd say that. So it's Friday the 30th, 30th of September, one week ahead, rather than Friday the 23rd of September. If you believe that, then you'll believe anything. Right. Um, the title is very grandiose. What it basically means is that I want to look at past and some elements of the future aspects of marginalized zones and some very weird stuff that I don't really understand and I'm hoping to get some insights from this audience. The weird stuff is at the end, uh, but I do want to include it because I've never seen anything quite like it myself. But we'll get to that. The other thing I want to mention is the volume Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which is advertised outside with a bunch of leaflets. That has about 17 papers in it, which really cover a lot of the talks that have been given in the last couple of days. There's flow size distribution and there's wave, in, wave ice interaction. There's all sorts of things in that volume. So I do encourage you to go to the Phil Trans website, Royal Society of London website, and have a look at it. Uh, there's lots of good stuff in there that I recommend. And I commend the editors, four of whom were here, Luke, Cecilia, uh, Danny, and then uh, three of whom, sorry, and uh, Alison and Michael are somewhere else at the moment. I think Mike's in India and Alison's probably in New Zealand. So without further ado, I'll start and say what I want to talk about. And I'm going to start with some really basic stuff about sea ice and the marginal ice zone. Just to remind you, because this is a, a conference which is supposed to be founded in mathematics, and mathematicians tend to use parsimonious models. And I really want to make sure that the mathematicians here really understand that sea ice is a horrendously complex material, and the marginal ice zone being made up of um, sea ice is equally complex. Then I'll move on and talk a bit about wave ice in interaction just to bring everyone up to speed on what it's all about. Give a few um, comments about some observations about um, wave ice interaction and uh, particularly around attenuation and whether or not we should be looking at conservative uh, induced attenuation, which is really about moving the waves around or dissipative attenuation, which one dominates or do we need to consider both? I'll give an example of a conservative model and I'll talk about uh, dissipation a little more there. And then I'll introduce this uh, slightly weird coastal data that I don't fully understand. Finally, right at the end, I'll return to the marginal ice zone and talk about my ideas for the future, which are also replicated in the, in the volume that I talked about first. So without further ado, sea ice is very complicated. In situ sea ice is very complicated. It's anisotropic, it's spatially and temporally heterogeneous. It's a mushy layer composed of ice crystals, brine, other salts. Uh, it can include natural matter in some circumstances. And important for wave ice interaction, it has a temp temperature gradient between the top and the bottom. And it depends on growth history. Of course, it depends, it, it uh, appears as continuous sheets. So we, uh, dealing with fast ice, which is can be can be very wide in extent. In extent, uh, grease ice, nilus. Uh, there were some nice photographs that we saw earlier in the week, and then of course we've got the separate flows starting around pancake ice, one or two meters across, and going up to vast flows that can be several kilometers or more if uh, we look back to how the Arctic used to look. And then we've got pressure ridges on top of that. Which, which can, I think the biggest one ever measured was 50 meters uh, keel to sail. So it's, it, these are big things and have to be taken into account. Again, in reference to wave ice interaction, it's mechanical property depends on strain rate and also the spatial scale you're looking at, which we've heard quite a lot about over the last few days. Moving on to the marginal ice zone, 
typically 50 to a couple of hundred kilometers across and defined by the NSIDC as the part of the season, seasonal ice zone where waves swell and other ocean processes affect the sea ice. So it's a very dynamic region and we have to take that into account. It has those waves, which we've uh, learned quite a lot about already, but it also has up and down welling, jets, streamers, bands, and eddies off the marginal ice zone in the water right next to the ice edge. There, have been, there has been a lot of field work done in the marginal ice zone, going way back into the 80s, which I, was, I participated in. The MISEX program ran from the early 80s, worked in the summer sea ice, and also there was a winter season. Um, so we collected a lot of data then. And there have been a lot, of, a lot of seasons subsequent to that which focused on the marginal ice zone. But it's so complicated and it's so multifaceted that we need more data even now. And the other aspect of it is that the instruments back then were quite different from the instruments now. Technology has moved on. Remote sensing is much better. And of course, the instruments that you might want to use in situ are much better. We don't use chart recorders on the ice that stop every now and again because they're cold and accelerometers and strain gauges bolted to the ice anymore. Finally, the last two, the flow size distribution is, is um, uh, it's an open question really. Uh, but loosely what happens with the flow size distribution if you discount Way, uh, if you discount currents and winds, um, it tends to increase in mean flow size as you move further in. And finally, rheology, we've heard quite a lot about that, the continuous rheologies that we're used to in the big models. Uh, we need to look as at the marginal ice zone as being composed of discrete elements. So I'll move on to wave ice interaction quickly. Um, we know that waves in the four to roughly 20 second band reduce in amplitude as they move through the ice. And that reduction in, uh, in amplitude uh, is caused by dissipative energy loss, but also a redistribution of um, wave energy because of conservative scattering. The waves break up the flows if they're sufficiently energetic and the move flows around. We haven't heard much about that. Um, Somebody mentioned radiation stress at some point, and, and that is quite important in the marginal ice zone. But with climate warming, things are getting a lot more intense. There's a, uh, quite a lot of satellite radar altimeter data that shows that the winds are increasing globally and the wave heights are increase, increasing globally. And we've also got the presence of more open water in the Arctic where the winds can couple to directly into uh, a marginal ice zone and build or create waves. So we have a greater destructive payload and the position where we, in the summer, the waves are gonna come in and break up the ice and create leads, which will uh, cause lateral melting in the surrounding ice. And in the winter, those leads are gonna freeze over. So we have a different situation in the summer and winter. So in the summer, we're gonna have a less compact uh, marginal ice zone type ice in the Arctic. And we're already seeing evidence of that. This is a, a, quite an old example I've used before of waves entering sea ice. It's, it's, I like it because the waves are very clear on the left-hand side there. It's in the East Greenland current. And the waves are coming in from the south and you've got three spectra at different distances in. And what you see from that uh, image, if I can get the pointer, is uh, a change in the spectra as you move further north in the um, directional spectra. Um, you can see they're very collimated here, and then suddenly it becomes much more uh, directionally spread. And the conservative models actually predict that. It's, it's a frequency dependent effect. So the short waves are spread first, and the long waves probably never spread because you're, you're too far into the marginal ice zone but certainly that collimation disappears as you go further in. The other thing that you can see is the change in wavelength. That's probably due to the differential attenuation of short waves before longer waves rather than dispersion. The other point I make there is this is an old image, as I said, 
but there's plenty of images now coming from Sentinel that show waves in ice on SAR radar pictures and also optical measurements. So this is, these are the observations that I foreshadowed. Um, they were collected together by Mike Malin and published in 2018. And what it shows is a very, very simple relationship between the attenuation coefficient in a uh, just a simple ex exponential law and the frequency omega. It's a power law relationship and the power is relatively low. Um, it can be as low as about two or it can, can go up to about 3.6 in the, in the few data sets that, that Mike analyzed. And that's clearly going to be a very important part of any uh, incorporation of um, wave, wave ice interaction into a GCM, for example, because it's a very simple parameterization that could really uh, capture uh, the features we want to look at. But it's empirical, of course, at the moment. So we have two, I've, I've touched on this a little bit, we have two paradigms here. We have a paradigm where we think of the marginal ice zone as being made up of independent ice flows, which all interact together. And we can add a bit of, we can, we can think of them as elastic plates because they're quite small relative to the wavelength. And we can model that quite well in terms of scattering theory. We can even put some e, uh, viscous uh, effects in the ice if you want. We can make them viscoelastic. Um, and we could, in principle, introduce some kind of viscosity into the uh, subadjacent water. Or we have a second paradigm where we have this nice simple law which is probably empirically based and essentially encapsulates all the dissipative effects and potentially includes some um, conservative physics too. And we can feed that into these big models, including WaveWatch, but in particular here, GCMs and Earth system models. Mathematicians favor one, of course, because you can play with it and you can create all sorts of weird and wonderful effects um, like localization and other things. Um, but you can't lose sight of the fact that the big models need something simpler than a fancy model uh, of conservative scattering. I'm going to talk about paradigm one and then I'm going to talk about paradigm two. And in talking about paradigm one, I'm going to introduce you to a simple scattering model uh, that uh, is just an example of what you can do. Um, nothing more. There's other models you could use. Uh, but the important thing is that the waves are coming in and they're scattered by the flows. So this is the kind of situation I, uh, I want to consider. We've got a whole bunch of circular flows and the waves are coming in from the left and they're interacting with those flows. The model I'm going to talk about uh, assumes linear water wave theory, lots of um, circular flows. And we choose circular because we're talking about a very large number of flows here, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 5 flows are possible. Uh, and it's possible to solve the, the problem with 10 to the 5 in a reasonable time. Um, each flow is represented by a thin elastic plate, where we could have imposed some viscoelasticity if we wanted to, uh, but it's easier and simpler to um, use uh, an elastic plate. Periodic motion, and then we've got multiple scattering but essentially dissipative effects are neglected. Now, the important thing there is, I'm not sure whether you can see them clearly, but there's a series of dashed red lines uh, which separate out the marginalized zone, the schematic marger, marginalized zone I'm showing into strips. And that's quite important. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider first the water and we'll write down um, some eigenfunctions that represent what's going on in the water. So we've got an instant field and we've got a scattered field made up of Bessel function type um, behavior. And the important thing is that in the open water, they're controlled by that dispersion relation, which is uh, just, just at the bottom there. And under the ice, we've got um, pretty much the same kind of uh, expansion, except that the dispersion relation now is is just a tiny bit different. It's got extra terms in, uh, which takes account that we're dealing with an elastic plate. Oh, 
Reject. What we do is we solve Reject. for a single, single cylinder, a single Reject. disc, and then we put all those discs together. And there's a nice theory that was developed in 1986, which enables us to do that very easily. Once we've got those together, think of all these um, discs making cylindrical waves that are all going in different directions. We combine those all together and we create a directional spectrum on either side of each strip. And finally, we put all the strips together. So this is it schematically shown on the right there, the D plot. The waves are coming in from the left. This might be the ice edge. And um, the waves are coming in from the left. So there's the, the waves coming in. We get reflection back, but some of the energy goes into the next strip, which reflects back into the first strip. So imagine all these strips together and this all interacts and we can solve for that. And we can do that with situations like run A there, uh, which is a pretty simple situation of two um, zones with different concentration and different randomized uh, disk diameters. Or we can do it with something a little bit more complicated where you can see very clearly that the concentration is much less in that particular strip. And the randomization is such that these are much bigger flows than these. So we've tried to create what um, a perfect marginalized zone looks like. And we can solve that and find out what the waves are doing. The band, which is number C there, or letter C, uh, it was done because we did an, I did an experiment back in MISEX where we put instruments either side of a band and measured what the directional spectrum was doing. And this model actually replicated that very well. Paradigm 2, on the other hand, is much more difficult. So here the problem is to ensure uh, that we encapsulate all of the things that are going on and all of the energy dissipation mechanisms that might happen. And that's quite difficult. And to my knowledge, no model does that. We also want to be able to deal with different concentrations. It's not as simple as you might think, because the dissipation is in the water and in the ice. And we also need to deal with different flow size distributions uh, and a changing flow size distribution as you go further into the ice. So to my knowledge, no model is able to, to get anywhere near that. Um, and in fact, if you look at the existing viscoelastic layer models or viscoelastic um, plate models, um, asymptotically, they are way off. We're looking at a power law relationship around three and they're predicting a power law relationship around 11. So they're way off asymptotically. So, and the other thing that's worth saying is, of course, the marginal ice is heterogeneous. So it may be that the power law um, is just too simple when we need to think about N changing as you go further into the ice. Okay, so that's the marginal ice zone temporarily forgotten. I now want to turn to this other slightly weird stuff uh, that I'm interested in because of a data set that uh, I've been looking at. And I asked the question, can shoreward infragravity waves propagate under fast ice? Infragravity waves have been measured in the Arctic Ocean way, way back uh, under ice by um, Ken Hunkins. It was in the early 70s, I think. And also, can these infragravity waves actually generate trapped waves moving along a shoreline and even lakey modes, which are going back out into the open ocean? Uh, yeah, I'm just going on to that. Yeah, an infragravity wave is part of the wave spectrum which sits in the 30 to 300 second by definition. I mean, it can be much broader than that. In fact, the ones I'm looking at are, are go down a little lower in period and don't reach 300 seconds, but they're long waves and they're generated because the, um, the amplitudes of the waves are, are groupy. And when they combine together, you get a, a, a wave envelope um, which is of much longer period. It's a modulation effect. And that creates radiation stresses which set these long waves going. You, you all will have seen infragravity waves coming ashore in the open water. They're the long oscillations you see uh, that come in. So the interesting thing is, can we get these under ice? 
So the data I'm looking at is from Sakhalin Island, which is in the Sea of Akots. And the Sea of Akots is an enclosed sea. So the first question is, if we can get these infragravity waves, where do they come from? Well, one possibility is they're formed in the North Atlantic, uh, North Pacific, and they come through the Kuril chain of islands, which are actually quite close together. Uh, the Kurils extend down from the Kamkat, I can't say this, Kamchatcha Peninsula in the north, right through down into Sakhalin Island. So it's possible they're formed out there and they come through the, the uh, Kuril Archipelago. The other possibility is they're generated within the Sea of Okots. So just going back to the question, can we first see infragravity waves? And if we can, what's the effect of them in drift ice, which is like a marginal ice zone? And can they form these other somewhat esoteric edge waves and leaky modes? So this is the schematic. Hopefully that helps you see what I'm talking about. Um, it's a cartoon showing the wind waves coming in and the swell, and then these forced infragravity waves, which I'm not sure of the source of. And the idea is that maybe they're going to energize some of these flows here to um, bob up and down and bend, but ultimately they'll go into the fast ice, they'll refract, they'll refract towards the normal, so they'll come in a little bit steeper, and then at the shoreline they'll bounce off and refract away from the normal, some of them will escape up to here, and some of them will get trapped because they, the, the angle's too big. So they'll end up going, duh, 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 duh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. that was clever. <laughs> um, so let's look first about the possibility of exciting the flows in the drift ice to move up and down. There's three plots here and they're different thicknesses, so we can just focus on one. So let's look at this one here. The waves I'm looking at are in the 50 to 70 second band. So they're quite long, but they're not as long as all infragravity waves. So just remember that. So the first thing I want to look at is the bobbing of the flow, just the motions of flows going up and down. Well, that doesn't help us because the bobbing occurs at about, for each flow size, occurs um, about seven or eight seconds. The next thing I want to look at is the rolling of the flows. And again, for each flow size, that's fairly stable all the way along, unless the flows have a relatively small diameter. Just think about it. The smaller you get, the, um, if, if they're a meter across and, and it, the thickness is a meter, they're not very stable. Jeepers, sorry about that. Um, so they're not going to help us to intersect the 15 to 70 second band. What about the bending? There's two kinds of bending you can consider with circular flows. The first is um, what, what are called nodal circles. If you can just imagine that the, there's a circular bending all the way around in a circle. And the other one is a diameter type bending. So it's going this way. And I've done, what I've done is I've worked out the different kind of modes that can be uh, created, the first lowish, lowish modes that can be created in circular flows for both dry modes and wet modes. Wet modes include the added mass, uh, which is generated in the fluid. And we, can, we really only need to look at one. If we look at the one, um, one nodal circle, that's the blue line going through there, and it intersects that 50 to second band. So what that's saying is um, for flows of about 100, 120, 200 meters, um, we can definitely see some kind of coupling between um, the, the flow and the band in which we're measuring the energy. And the same thing happens for higher, um, higher modal uh, nodal circles, um, but we don't need to worry about that too much at here. These are the data. Um, on the left, you've got the time series that were recorded in uh, consecutive experiments for several years. And the data are quite interesting. They show long waves. That's the first thing to say. But the second thing to say is that there's a change here in the, the noisiness of the data, if you like. This looks much cleaner in this little region here. And that's when the ice is there. The ice appears uh, sometime in January, early January, and it stretches through to early April. These are the spectra. 
that correspond to these data. And you can see there's something in that 15 to 70 second band uh, each year uh, from 2010 through to 2014. And these spectra were, were, made, were generated in 2013 and show the open water spectra is quite different from what's happening under the ice. So we can see infragravity waves if you, if you think those, that 15 to 70 second band are infragravity waves. This is the experiment where we look at the possibility of whether or not we're seeing edge waves or leaky modes. And it's a simple experiment because unfortunately, even though we deployed lots of instruments, the instruments uh, tend to get annihilated because they're sitting on the seafloor. We've got spectrograms here, and I'm not going to pay a lot of attention to the ones on the left. These are alongshore, but you can see the presence of the ice. That's where the amplitudes drop. And I want you to notice that thing there. That's an oscillation, which is much clearer when the ice is there in the coherence. The coherence looking at the strength of the association between two, stri uh, two sites. Um, much clearer when the... Um, ice is not there than when the ice is there. It's, it's a little vaguer and it moves when the ice is there, but it's still present. So there's some kind of oscillation uh, which is moving along the shore at those long periods, and we can check that with phase. This is the interesting one. Um, I'm looking here at, again, offshore. So that one and that one are offshore, slightly different scale, unfortunately, but you can see where the ice is. And this weird structure comes out, which is a sort of discrete spectral structure uh, when the ice is present. So what I've done is, this is coherence, so it's just the association between the two sites showing there's a very large association. So I've calculated the gain function, and it comes out to be 2.2 at that period there, which is about nine minutes. Very significant peak. Now leaky modes, which are these modes that run offshore, are modeled by Bessel functions, just the decay of the Bessel function. So I've, for each of these periods here, I've plotted the Bessel function. This is under ice, this is under water. So, and the main one here at nine minutes is this dashed line. And I wanna compare these two sites theoretically with this one up here. And this is 2.2 and this is 2.2, but it's a complete, it's luck, it's nothing more than that. I, I mean, it, it happens to be the same, but, and I didn't fudge it, it just happened to, to, to come right. So it's possible that we are actually seeing leaky modes. Final, final slide, thank you for listening. I did say I wanted to talk about the questions that I think are still open uh, in, in the context of the marginal ice zone. And these are they, so moving down the list, we need to resolve the question of how to define the marginal ice zone. We've got a definition, but it's not a useful definition in terms of modeling. It doesn't tell us how wide the marginal ice zone is. All it tells us is it's, it's nasty, it's got lots of waves, etc. So we need to say, is it dependent on the, can, can we get a, a definition that depends on concentration, which satellites might be able to provide and do? Um, flow size distribution, or even waves, you know, how far the waves go before they decay. So that needs to be worked on. We need the FSD statistical law, which we heard about yesterday. Is it a Pareto distribution, a broken Pareto distribution, or is it a log, log normal distribution, or something, a co combination of them, or something else? Um, I mentioned this, we need more data, unfortunately. Everyone says that, but um, I'm afraid the marginal ice zone is so complicated that we do need data. We need purpose-built constitutive relations, and I believe they need to be based on discrete element interactions. And finally, with all that, we, we can then think about uh, a parameterization that can be put into Earth system models. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Vernon. Uh, I 
I think uh, uh, one point, important point is missing on uh, your to-do list. It's uh, to understand what the, what's actually happening. So it's, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, I see the, all the week, uh, the, uh, the uh, focus was on data based. Uh, basis. So they to collect data, to do statistics. So I believe a little bit dangerous, uh, this uh, way of uh, just one direction. So this is all right, oh, but the, the, yeah, but just a moment. The, what's, what's the, <laughs> uh, originally, I uh, was uh, working, say, in naval field. And in naval field, you cannot use the previous experience to design new ship. It's just not allowed, because this is another, another story. But uh, in uh, say ice business, this is kind of getting standard, and I be, I think the we uh, um, we are forgetting about the uh, first principles. What's actually going on? And I have a question. Please, you could just comment. The, que the question is: the question is, do you think? Um, I do not. Do you think that uh, computational fluid dynamics may resolve some questions? For example, the uh, floating pieces of interaction in waves. We can potentially simulate it and to to, to find something. Yeah. Is it possible? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I, I think it's hard. I think it's very hard. And I, I'm worried that we don't really know all the processes that are acting. But yes, I think I think we have to do that if we're going to trust the uh, attenuation laws that we use. And the suggestion that I'm getting over the last two days is that the the way the waves attenuate really do determine the flow size distribution, etc., which is is crucial, may be crucial um, to uh, GCM type models. So I, I do think that we need to put some activity into getting this dissipation sorted. The con I, I, I feel that the mathematical part, the conservative part is all sorted. I don't think we need to do a lot of work there. I think we understand that pretty well now. Um, but certainly all these weird and wonderful fluid dynamic effects need to be thought through. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we should move to our next speaker, Daniela Flocka. Thank you.